Hello, thank you for joining with me. We are reading chapter 28 with the Course Companions. We are on section 6, The Secret Vow. Dear God, please enable me to set aside everything I think I know for an open mind and a new experience. Allow me to set aside everything that holds me back from seeing the truth, from seeing what you would have me see. Being who you would have me be, going where you would have me go, doing what you would have me do, and saying what you would have me say, and to whom. And so it is. Thank you, God. Amen. The secret vow. Who punishes the body is insane. For here the little gap is seen, and yet it is not here. It has judged itself, nor it has not judged itself, nor made itself to be what it is not. Footnote 28. It, in this sentence and in the rest of the paragraph, is the body. So the body does not seek to make of pain a joy and look for lasting pleasure in the dust. It does not tell you what its purpose is and cannot understand what it is for. It does not victimize because it has no will, no preferences, and no doubts. It does not wonder what it is, and so it has no need to be competitive. It can be victimized, but it cannot feel itself as a victim. It accepts no role, but it does what it is told without attack. It is indeed a senseless point of view to hold responsible for sight a thing that cannot see and blame it for the sounds you do not like, although it cannot hear. It suffers not the punishment you give because it has no feeling. It behaves in ways you want but never makes the choice. It is not born and does not die. It can but follow aimlessly on the path on which it has been set. And if that path is changed, it walks as easily another way. It takes no sides and judges not the road it travels. It perceives no gap because it does not hate. It can be used for hate, but it cannot be hateful made thereby. The thing you hate and fear and loathe and want, the body does not know. You send it forth to seek for separation and be separate. And then you hate it, not for what it is, but for the uses you have made of it. You shrink from what it sees and what it hears and hate its frailty and its littleness. And you despise its acts, but not your own. Footnote 29. Despising the body's acts which are seen as not your own refers to despising behaviors that seem to be motivated by the body's instinctive drives such as those for sex, food, or aggression, but are really motivated by the mind. And back to the text. It sees and acts for you. It hears your voice and it is frail and little by your wish. It seems to punish you and thus deserve your hatred for the limitation which it brings to you. Yet you have made of it a symbol of the limitations which you want your mind to have and see and keep. The body represents the gap between the little bit of mind you call your own and all the rest of what is really yours. You hate it, yet you think it is yourself and that without it would yourself be lost. This is the secret vow that you have made with every brother who would walk apart. This is the secret oath you take again whenever you perceive yourself attacked. No one can suffer if he does not see himself attacked and losing by attack. Unstated and unheard in consciousness is every pledge to sickness. Yet it is a promise to another to be hurt by him and to attack him in return. Sickness is anger taking out upon the body so that it will suffer pain. It is the obvious effect of what was made in secret, in agreement with another's secret wish to be apart from you, as you would be apart from him. Unless you both agree this is your wish, it can have no effects. Whoever says, there is no gap between my mind and yours has kept God's promise 
not his tiny oath to be forever faithful unto death. Footnote 30. Revelation 2.10 Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. In this Bible verse, being faithful unto death means being faithful even if it results in one's death. In the Course, being faithful unto death is a play on words in which we have vowed to be faithful to death itself. And by his healing is his brother healed. Let this be your agreement with each one, that you be one with him and not apart. And he will keep the promise that you make with him, because it is the one which he has made to God as God has made to him. God keeps his promises, his son keeps his. In his creation did his father say, You are beloved of me, and I of you forever. Be you perfect as myself, for you can never be apart from me. His son remembers not that he replied, I will, though in that promise he was born. Yet God reminds him of it every time he does not share a promise to be sick, but lets his mind be healed and unified. His secret vows are powerless before the will of God, whose promises he shares. And what he substitutes is not his will, who has made promises of himself to God. This is Robert Perry's commentary for Day 329, Section 6, The Secret Vow. The first four paragraphs of this section express a view of sickness that is found throughout the Course though perhaps no more fully than here. It is a view that makes logical sense, yet the dynamic described is clearly unconscious and therefore difficult to take on board on a personal level. Let's therefore stretch ourselves in an attempt to do just that. The basic idea is that we make the body sick by blaming it, which then punishes it. Since the body is a mental construct, our mental act of blaming it actually alters it. It's like pointing a sun lamp at a fragile plant which then withers. That, according to the Course, is how the body gets sick. Deep down inside, regardless of how we feel about our bodies consciously, we are all aiming this hot glare of blame at them. What do we blame the body for? The main thing is clearly its attacks. We blame it for victimizing, for being competitive, for the negative role it plays, for its negative behavior, for its hateful uses, for its separating behavior, for what it gets used for, for its acts. These all say the same thing. We blame it for acting so selfishly, callously, competitively, attackingly. The logic seems to be that we think the body's own instincts and needs are more responsible for its behavior than we are. We also blame it for seeing and hearing such unrewarding, depressing world. We also blame it for seeing and hearing such an unrewarding, depressing world, and we blame it for its frailty, excuse me, frailty and its littleness, and the limitations those qualities seem to impose on us. Again, we don't need to be consciously aware of these feelings. We may regard our body as a holy temple and feel awe and wonder at its intricate design. Yet, underneath that, it is impossible for a limitless being of pure love to feel stuffed inside this vicious little primitive body and not have these resentments somewhere inside. Try to get in touch with those resentments. Can you locate any sense of resentment towards your body? Not for its special deficiencies, but for imposing on you the limitations needs needs and base instincts that everybody has. With this in mind, I want to ask you to reread the first three paragraphs of this section very slowly. When you come across an it that refers to the body, especially where that it begins a sentence, say your body instead. When you come across you or your, insert your name 
after that where appropriate. So read the first three paragraphs of section six slowly. Replace it with your body and when you come across you or your, insert your name and go through slowly and see what effect it has on you. What was your reaction? You can pause and come back to this. Mine was that my body suddenly seemed like a completely inert, non-sentient thing. It doesn't do anything, feel anything, see anything, search for anything. Rather than imposing things on me, it's really the other way around. I impose my will on it. The body is not a horse that gallops wherever it wants with me helplessly along for the ride. It's much more like a metal tool in my hand. Everything it does is entirely up to me. I'm the one in charge. In which case, why would I blame it? Because blaming it is part and parcel with my real attachment, which is thinking of my body as myself. This is the secret vow that you have made with every brother who would walk apart. According to Jesus, in that same deep place in me that resents the body for doing what all bodies do, I have made a joint promise with everyone that we will be these bodies. We have all taken this unconscious group oath to be separate alone, attacking and attacked. Having promised to be separate bodies, we then fall into exactly what this section says. We blame our bodies and thereby make them sick. Yet there is even deeper promise we have made. When God created us, he made this promise to us. You are beloved of me and I of you forever. Be you perfect as myself, for you can never be apart from me. Our creation was only complete when we replied, I will, which means our promise to him is built into the very fabric of our being. That promise then can always be called upon. As we face a brother who is sick, we call upon it by, be by setting aside our secret vow and making this promise to our brother instead. There is no gap between my mind and yours. And then God reminds us of our ancient vow when he promised himself to us and we promised ourselves to him. A promise that will stand forever long after this world has passed. Thank you so much for joining with me. Day 329, Section 6, The Secret Vow.